Well, good afternoon. I want to go ahead and get started on time to allow Professor Blanco uh, the full amount of time to give her presentation. I want to welcome you to the second in the faculty series of uh, lectures. Uh, today's conversation is part of an ongoing series at the School of Public Policy, uh, organized by one of my colleagues, Professor Ted McAllister, who can't be with us today. Um, I just want to thank you for your time and for coming. Uh, there's a lot of exciting developments, not only in California, in Washington, D.C., but also around the world. And today's talk is going to tie into that thread. We're, we're blessed at the School of Public Policy to have on our faculty uh, Dr. Luisa Blanco. She's an expert in economic development and international economics. Um, not only does she teach those courses here, our students are also fortunate to have her in the core classes in microeconomic and macroeconomics. Uh, she received her doctorate from the University of Oklahoma, and her presentation today is just one of the family of subjects in her research. Her research spans such topics as tax havens. It looks at issues related to education and democracy with an emphasis on Latin American developing, developing nations, although clearly the lessons are generalizable across the globe. Her current projects, as I mentioned, include those two as well as today's work. Today's work actually extends some research that, she did, that uh, just recently was published in the Journal of Development Studies looking at determinants of political instability in Latin America. And so with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Luisa Blanco. In 2008, Argentinian President Cristina Kirchner, she uh, proposed to nationalize the private pension fund, and that was approved by Congress. Uh, and in January of 2009, those funds were part of the government, and they uh, are already allocated for government programs. At the beginning of the year, um, we had that in Bolivia, there was majority support for a referendum that is going to allow Evo Morales to be reelected. Then in 2008, we had the, uh, the Ecuadorians also approving a new constitution to allow uh, Rafael Correa to, be, uh, to give him the possibility to be in power until 2017. Then we had that during the municipal elections of 2008 in Nicaragua, there was um, the Sandinist Party, which is the party to which uh, the president Daniel Ortega is associated with, won actually 94 out of 146 mayorships. And it is argued that the president was involved in fraud during these elections. Then, last but not least, our uh, most popular leader in the region, Hugo Chavez, we have here that last week, just last week we had that he has proposed an amendment to the Constitution, and for this amendment we had a great turnout, 7% of the population came up, and they vote, and they, we had that the 55% support this amendment to the Constitution to eliminate the term limits where uh, this change is going to allow Chavez to, be, uh, to run for indefinite re-election. Well, that's why we are here today to talk about these uh, very radical changes in Latin America. And today, uh, my presentation is going to be focusing, uh, the first thing that I will talk about is to define these leftist movements, understand, um, understand what, what they look like, then understand why, why the new developments are relevant for uh, today uh, when we relate it to history, going back to understand a little bit the history of Latin America, then I also will talk about this idea that when we look at these leftist movements, they are actually not all the same, and we can have uh, this. We need to make this distinction, and I like to call it between the movements that they seem to have given a sharp turn to the left. I like to call it a sharp turn to the left, and then I like to think about some of the leftist movements that they have done, kind of like a slight turn to the left. And I'm going to be discussing about the difference between these movements. Then I also will uh, present to you uh, my research proposal, where uh, my main research question is to try to empirically determine what are the factors that explain the rise of the left in Latin America. So for that, I'll talk a little bit about the methodology that I intend to use. I'll talk a little bit about the factors that they have been uh, posited as the, main, uh, as the main causes of the rise of the left. And then I'll talk also a little bit about the limitations of my research and then conclude with the possible, uh, possible policy implications. Uh, this is a research proposal, it's an ongoing project, and we will have like 10 minutes of discussion, so I will appreciate your comments or ideas. It will be a great time uh, for you to, to bring those up. 
Okay, so here talking about right now, what is going on in Latin America. And if we look at this map, pretty much here, uh, we can see that in that map, actually, if we look at Latin America, and here I am going to define Latin America in the broad sense, where we say that we are going to include all of those countries in the Americas, where the main language is Spanish and Portuguese. And what we can see, actually, is that 15 out of 21 are actually either considered as a country that has a president that is associated with either the left or the center left. So therefore here, we can see here, uh, the map looks quite red, well, right? So therefore, uh, you can see that, and we can see that uh, if we can uh, want to relate this to history. We want to look at this and see how, how relevant is this for history. And then I also want to mention, I like to call them in that map, so it looks quite red, and then in that map I like to mention two countries that they are blue right now, but I like to call them those countries that they are flirting with the left. I like to call it the flirters. And here we can think about the case of Mexico, right? During the Mexican elections of 2006, we had that the leftist leader lose by, lost by a very small percentage, right? Less than 1%. Then also, I like to talk about the case of Honduras, because even if the president is not exactly from coming from a leftist party, he just signed an agreement. Uh, he just signed an agreement with Hugo Chavez last year, where he um, he became a member of the Bolivarian Alternative for the Americas, the ALBA program, which is uh, um, in the leadership of Hugo Chavez. Right. So, so here you can look a little bit more red, right? Well, but why is this relevant? So here what I do, I kind of look back to the economic history of Latin America and to uh, what I'm using here is use some uh, information from a data set on political institutions which was constructed by Beck and others and pretty much what he does is that he associates the party to which the president is associated with um, across the ideological spectrum, right? So he has his data set for uh, 20 Latin American countries that goes from 1975 to 2006. What I do, I expand his data set to kind of follow the methodology that he uses. I expand it a little bit more so that I can have information about 2007 and 2008. So what you can see here right now is uh, the probability uh, that a Latin American country has a right expression president, right? So here it is obvious from this graph that there has been a decrease on the probability that a Latin American country, looking out of 20 Latin American countries, I took away Puerto Rico, which was included in, in the previous map that I showed you as a, as a Latin American country, because they didn't propose, uh, didn't have data on that country. And here what we can see, right, is this uh, significant decrease on uh, the probability that there is a president from the right in Latin America. So here, um, also something that we can relate to this graph is to look at the five-year averages, right? So we prefer to look at the five-year average to uh, smooth out these large fluctuations. And what is very interesting is that if we look at the five-year average, we find that uh, this probably, the probability that the president is from the right reaches its maximum in the late 1990s, in the early 1990s, and then, um, which is equal to 64 percent, but then it lowers down to today, to the average between uh, the years between 2005 and 2008, to 33 percent. So here we have this uh, huge decrease on uh, the probability that it is a president from the right. Well, how about the left? Well, it, it moves in the opposite direction, right? Where here we can see the significant increase on the number of presidents in the region that they are uh, associated with the left. And in these classifications, we're just looking at uh, whether they are light, uh, red, right or left, and we don't take into consideration the center left or the center right. And this may understate a little bit the current situation actually, because we had a lot of center left uh, countries. Well, so here we look at these stats, we can see that the probability that a Latin American country has a leftist president is actually um, its highest right now. Uh, the average, the 5G average, we look between 2005 and 2008. Uh, it is actually 40%, which is the, the highest uh, along this period of time. So here another stat is that if we look in 1975, uh, we say that in 1975 we have five leftist presidents and uh, nine rightist presidents. Well, by 2008, the number of leftist presidents doubles to 10, and then the number of rightist presidents decreases to three, actually, in the region.